Okay. Um, so for today, we will be discussing quality management in product development. Um, I think the best way I can introduce this is, uh, you know how in industries or um, in production companies, yes, in production companies, um, regular production companies, you um, produce things and um, you have to ensure that it's of um, standard quality. You have to test um, to make sure there are like litmus um, standards for testing to make sure that they meet the required standards and um it will be there. like let's say you're producing a detergent there will be different standards for you to um use and you know prove or confirm that your product matches the standard that you had in mind for it right and um you want to check its reaction to the skin reaction to the to the fabrics, to different fa fabrics. So in case you need to give a warning, um, reaction to colored fabric fa fabrics and reaction to um, white fabrics, right? And then um, how it responds to machine use and um, its response to um, hand use because quite largely um, a lot of Nigerians are still um, are still not financially in the space to own washing machines so um you want to also confirm that when people use your detergent to wash they don't have to worry about skin reactions and all that so um for a production company that that produces um detergents or laundry soap and or laundry pods like the tiny tablets of soaps you um want to um you you would have standards that at the end of your production, these are the standards that your products should meet so that you can say that you can confirm that you have um, done everything or that you have a product that you can launch. Yes, basically that's the goal, that your product is finally at a quality that you can launch. Um, that's what that's what you'll be doing. And what that level or that stage in your um, production process will be called your testing and phase. Right, um, which involves quality control, quality management, and all that quality assurance. And um, this same thing would apply to um, product development, digital or tech product development. Um, you want to have criteria that you, which, with which you want to judge your product or test your product to ensure that it is at a place where it can be launched and it can compete successfully in the market that it is going into and um that is what we'll be discussing today um the first thing we'll be looking at is um i'll be introducing you to quality management itself um qa qc quality assurance quality control and software development importance of quality management differences between quality assurance and quality control role of a pm in quality management building an efficient testing process and quality assurance tools and then the conclusion of the lesson um, mind you everyone please this is the lesson for um so supposed to be the lesson for yesterday and we are taking it on today if by the time we want to take on the next lesson and um time has gone down so much we, we could just cut it into two and share it between today and tomorrow i'll try to rush this lesson but um without losing the quality of delivery of the lesson okay so quality management and software or product development involves the involves the process of ensuring that the product meets the highest quality standards set in terms of functionality, usability, and user satisfaction. So, um, like I said before, that the whole point of quality management is to ensure that, um, you, the, like, everything that you've put into your product has built a product that matches all of the set standards or 
decide pre-decided standards that um you've looked into before embarking on the journey of building these products right and um you're looking at the functionality the usability and it's the ability of your product to satisfy your users or your targeted users adopting efficient quality assurance and quality control measures ensures that a product functions optimally in a way that leaves your users satisfied in software development quality management involves five main aspects against which the product should be tested against oh, against which the product should be tested so um, the first one is the performance of the product this will be um, how well the entire system of your product um, performs or you know the like the yeah the functionality how it functions um in regards to its backend systems you want to ensure that everything that you are promising that your features are the, like the features of your product that they are delivering um as as promised basically like what you're what you're checking for is that for every promise that um each feature has made during um say marketing or during documentation that when the product is tested or put to the test that they can perform at that level that you have promised so um the next one is usability this refers to the ease of to the ease with which users can use the system and understand it so um it's one thing to create a fanciful product but how user friendly is it right like you want a product that um people do not struggle to um use for um the task with for which it has been um purchased downloaded um whatever you want to call it um if, if i have downloaded your product to be able to um, reach out to healthcare providers um, for health issues. If I start to struggle with I'm um, doing that, then um, I, I, I like if things like for if things like I can't upload um, my ID, I can't um, access customer service representatives to um, different platforms so that I can complain about my health issue or um, just whatever it is concerning my health. And um, these are fe features that your product promised um, while I was downloading it, so I'm making researches about it. And then I'm unable to, I'm suddenly unable to do that. I'm suddenly unable to use um, your product to perform these tasks. Then it's not usable for me, or I, I'm getting confused just trying to figure out how to use your app. Then um, it's, not, it's not a usable app. It's, there's a problem with its, with its usability. That's one of the things you get to test um, when you're trying to do your quality management. Then reliability um, refers to the ability of a system to continue operating without breakdowns or failures. In regards to software products, this will be, um, the best way to check this is how many bugs um, or, or how often bugs are found with your products, how often there is interruption, interruptions or breakdowns in um the functionality of your product um like so what you're judging is not whether it is functional what you're judging is how often is your interruption and how functional it is so yes it is functional but um do we constantly face issues of a breakdown or like a shutdown you know how sometimes you're trying to use an app and it suddenly goes off by itself and then some, sometimes you get an error message that says there was a problem. Um, there was we've encountered a problem loading your loading your your app. Please try again. Something like some error message like that. Um, that's that's um, an example of a breakdown. A breakdown in functionality, right? Like so, while it was or it's it's it is in a general sense a functional product. It's it's um facing issues with breakdowns or inter, um, just inter, in general interruptions and its, it's usability or functionality. And um, that is, that makes it, that, that then it will be interpreted by a user as your product being unreliable. So that means if OP, every time I open OP, it suddenly shuts down by itself 
and closes or blacks my screen out. And um, this happens every time I try to do a transaction. So I have to load OP like three times or four times before I'm able to use it. This would start to register OP in my head as a user as um, to be an unreliable product. So you want to test for that or you want to check for that. Um, the maintainability, this refers to how easy it is to understand and modify code so that changes or code modifications can easily be made when necessary. So um, you want your um, code repository to be um, easily, um, you know, easily edited or easily modified um, to suit new challenges or to fix new challenges or bugs or to um, just do upgrades that would suit what um, the new trend in the market for your product is or to um, do updates to features just to um, stay ahead of the curve or the comp or competition curve. So um, you, you, you want the codes that will make your product functional to be easy to, um, maybe not easy, the right balance for modification, updates, and changes that will be beneficial for your uh, market positioning and um, just your your users, the satisfaction of your users, right? Um, that's something you want to look out for in quality management. And then um, interoperability. This refers to testing whether a system will work with other operation, operating systems, Android or iOS for mobile um, applications, browsers, Chrome or Safari or web applications without having compatibility issues. Okay, so um, most times when launching um, a software product, you are launching a version that um, is compatible with an Android device um, for the mobile um, for the mobile devices, an Android device or an iOS device, and um, as well as, uh, mind you, Android comes in different versions, right, um, or in different variations, and we want to ensure that your product is also adaptable to those different variations of Android. So you don't want just people with the most recent Android um, version to be able to be the only ones using Android that can use um that their or that their device devices can access your product and that's that starts to limit your market um share automatically and um you also don't want the most just the most recent ios versions to be be the ones that can access your product um so this is it to interoperability is basically compatibility um with operating systems just generally speaking, like when, when you want to think about interoperabilities, how how adaptable is your product to um, different operating systems, be it um, mobile products or be it web pages, right? You want to, sorry, web applications. You want to ensure that um, for different operating systems that your product is adaptable to all of them or compatible with all of them. Um, that's something you want to ensure with your quality management. These five aspects of quality management are benchmarks against the against which quality checks for products will be conducted will be conducted. So um, these are basically when you talk about your quality management or what you do in quality management, there are just five aspects um, or five main aspects because for each of these, they can be further expanded, right? Like you could talk about it in so much more details and you start feeling like there is there are more to each of them. But um, the five main aspects of quality management um, are these listed um, and they are just the benchmarks that you want to use to ensure that your quality or the quality of your product is standard. Um, there are three main activities that entail the entire process of quality management in software development, and they are the quality control, the quality planning, and the quality assurance. For the context of this course, we will only address quality assurance and quality control. 
Um, something you can do, quality planning is not so different from the two. Something you can do is just read it up. It's not, um, it's not as expansive as quality control and quality assurance, but it's also not so different from them. It's just how do you plan like for for quality delivery basically like just do a quick google search it's a very brief um it, it takes a very short time to gain clarification on it um but when it comes to products management you are more concerned with um quality assurance and quality control um as a product manager in software development quality assurance is the proactive process of putting measures in place to ensure potential defects are prevented from the beginning of the software development phase. So again, um, in software development, quality assurance is a proactive. Remember, um, emphasis on the word proactive. You don't wait for things to happen before you start to think of solutions or um, a quick fix for an already existing problem. So quality assurance, the goal is to be proactive, to have strategies in place or um, plans in place in case of unforeseen situations, basically. You want to be proactive with it and make plans and assume certain situations. Um, um, so you, you, it says here, that it is the proactive process of putting measures in place. So which would mean that you would have to assume certain defects, right? Or possible outcomes of, of possible, um, yeah, just possible outcomes of certain decisions that are being made concerning um, the product. So um, the process of putting measures in place to ensure potential defects are prevented from beginning from the beginning of the software development phase. So it, it's like, when we say proactive, it's like a preventive measure you take to ensure that this doesn't even occur in the first place. So just the same way that you want to ensure, you make assumptions to ensure that you are covering all customer types or all user types, right? That's what we do with user persona. Like you're assuming different personas of people or personalities of people that could possibly become your um, your users or the users of your of your product. Um, what you're doing is that you're pre-planning, right? You're being proactive to ensure that you are they are covered in your plans, right? That your product um, offerings cover different personality types. That's basically what you're doing. And that's what you do with um, this quality assurance. You want to be proactive and think of possible defects. Um, they are usually defects that uh, out like it feels like it's right in your face that it could be a problem in the future or um, that it could be a defect that you would have to deal with in the future. You want to make plans for them. And um, first, your, the first thing is to tackle it already, like ensure that you've done something to prevent it. But also you want to be prepared for in case even your preventive measure doesn't work, right? That's something you also do. The goal of um, quality assurance testing is to identify defects and prevent them from by ensuring processes are correctly implemented from the beginning of the project. So you want to catch defects early enough. And that's why there are a series of tests that um, software products go through. All of those tests is just to be proactive and be preventive. They are preventive measures. You don't, this is not to say that products don't ever encounter problems or bugs after they've been launched, but the goal is that the, the personality or sorry, um, the, the experience of your users with your product doesn't become that of constant problems, constant bugs, constant um, complaints. So you want as minimal complaints as possible by the time you launch your products, which is why um, quality assurance measures are done to prevent and to be proactive with possible defects. The goal of your quality assurance testing is to identify defects and prevent them by ensuring processes are correctly implemented from the beginning of the project. Quality control, on the other hand, is the reactive method of meticulously 
checking a product for errors or bugs at the tail end of product development. Okay, so, um, okay, if a product passes quality control, then it is ready for launch and can be released into the hands of users. So with quality assurance, the, co the goal of quality assurance is through the entire process or the entire phases of um, product development, you are assuming certain defects that could come up and you are fixing them as you go along the way right so you're not waiting for the end of the process to do this to um identify possible problems or um, identify existing defects so usually qa testings would happen um with like for every phase of development that you get through um with the products like once you start you, you've started your development um for for every implementation of like for every code implementation you're ensuring that this um that, that there is no defect or that each defect that you found you find in the process is addressed but with quality control you are uh, this is done at the end um of your development cycle but um it's done to like as um a pre-launch yeah, a pre-launch process, right? It's, it's like a pre-launch reactive process where you're, um, when you're finally done with your product and you're like re ready to launch your testing for final, um, it's like your final testing, you're trying to find out before we launch what is um, something that could go wrong or what could be wrong with our products or what problems could our users encounter. So this is at the end when you're ready to launch that's the difference between quality assurance and um, control. With assurance, assurance, like, I'll give an example. If someone says um, their, their dad is very assuring with words, right? That means for every phase of their life, their, their father speaks life into them and um, continues to, you know, assure them that he is there for them, for example. It's very assuring. But... Um, with quality control, it's not the same thing. With quality control, you wait until the, you're done with your, pro you have a product to launch already. So now what you're testing is that we are ready to go to the mark, to, to go to market. So we're trying to ensure it's part of your prepping, your pre-launch prepping. So you're trying to ensure that you are, um, everything that you've worked for um, is actually what you have in your product. So it's like your final testing before you release your product, basically. That's what quality control is. And um, sometimes with this, you will find bugs or errors and um, that need fixing, and you're able to address that. And um, usually for quality control, there is a quality control report as well. Like I think um, down into the lesson, you will, you will discuss that. Um, there is a quality control report that you would need to have. Um, to have signed off by the head of quality control um, or yeah, the head of the QA engineering um, team, you you want that report covering every um, possible scenario and confirming that your the compatibility of your product, the usability and all those things and um, with the head of QA signing off on it. And the goal is that you can say without reasonable doubt that um, you've done everything within your power to prepare for launch. So as far as humanly possible, within this um, development cycle, you, you've not found any reason to not launch your product um, in reference to quality, right? Because at the end of the day, it's one thing to launch a product, but there's another thing to launch a quality product. So... Um, if a product passes quality control or QC, then it is ready for launch and can be released into the hands of users. It is a systemic approach that requires um, that requires careful planning and execution. QC involves testing and product the product against documented requirements to see whether the various aspects of the product meet set standard. So with um, QC, so with QA, when you are testing your product along the way as you as you are developing, you um you may not have written down standards that you or requirements that you are working with, right? Like this is not necessarily where you say um where you have 
the requirements like you know in your product requirements documents you you talk about how do you confirm i've forgotten what the term is called but um how do you confirm that you like this feature is delivering what you want it to deliver like how do you confirm um that you have exactly what you envisioned for this feature and um with Q qa with quality assurance you're not doing like that is not your goal your goal is just that for each step that you are taking you're doing the um like you're fixing every problem that comes with it but with qc you're trying you have a requirement or requirements that you are following so for every time that um for each um qc testing that you're doing um you're measuring it against a requirement for, for the most part you're measuring it against a requirement to ensure that it meets the standard that your requirements have set for it that's basically what um, you're doing with QC. It is a systemic approach that requires careful planning and execution. QC involves testing the product against documented requirements to see whether the various aspects of the product meet of the product meets set standard. Therefore, um, where QA provides the guidelines, QC entails the practical examination. Um, <clears throat> the importance of quality assurance management one enhanced user satisfaction of course um a product riddled with bugs creates friction frustration and qa um, guarantees a smooth enjoyable user journey leading to higher satisfaction and loyalty if if your product is um without bugs or with minimal bugs like so minimal that your it doesn't become a theme for using your product yes what i was talking about is acceptance criteria thank you joy um i was talking about acceptance criteria when i was saying that um with qa you don't really have an acceptance criteria that you are going for because you're still going through the phases of development but with your qc you have acceptance criteria within your requirements that you're looking to make sure that you're meeting up with when you're doing your QC testing. Thank you again, Joy. Okay. So um, for your um, for the importance of quality management, I was saying that um, with less friction and less frustration, and um, the goal is that you, there is no friction at all. But of course, because we're talking about um, we have servers that we have to be concerned with and all of those things and especially if you're dealing with products where there will be situations with payments and all that you cannot 100 percent guarantee um the absence of bugs or friction so um the less friction and bugs um or your your users experience um the, the that means the less frustrations they feel in their user journey with your product and that means loyalty you get loyalty from that because people feel like it's easy to embark on a journey with your product to get things done with your product um reduced costs fixing bugs post launch is a resource intensive effort early detection through qa minimizes rework and associated costs so um you know how so you know how um during or post launch, you already have a product, and um, you have your engineers always trying to fix bugs. I want you to think of that situation, and think of um, versus an engineering team that has so little bugs to fix on, not like no bugs to fix. What they could be doing with their time, they could be you could be bringing innovative ideas as a product manager for them. Um, to work on new features that could take your entire product um, to the next level um, or you could bring in new features that could make your product even much more competitive within its market um, instead of your entire engineering team, designing team, everybody um, worrying about bugs and um, discussing bugs and frictions with um, the application um of your products for like whatever it is it's supposed to be solving and um it says here that um fixing bugs post launch is a resource in intensive effort early detection through qa minimizes rework and associated associated costs 
So sometimes the cost that we talk about, of course, it involves actual money because um, there is financial maintenance of um, whatever you do um, back end without going into too much details of it, whatever it is you do back end, there's a financial implication to it. Um, but that aside, money is the easier one to come by. Something you cannot get back as a team is time. For every time you spend on doing one thing, you, that time could have been spent on, you know, doing greater things or achieving greater things. So um, for me, it's easy to break down losses or disadvantages to just money. But for me as a product manager, I worry about other resources being spent on things that could have been prevented from the start. Um, risk mitigation, efficient quality control checks ensure ensure that the risk of a product breaking down or a product not delivering its intended value post-launch is significantly minimized. So um, this covers you when it comes to the risk of um, just the general risk of using your product or um, I'll give you an instance. If you have a fintech product and um, you don't encrypt the process of um, messaging, like in-app messaging, you don't encrypt the process of um, um, in-app messaging, um, password, uh, email password, and all those things. Um, if those things are not properly done and you don't find out um, because you don't have a proper quality control check list or process, you um, it, it becomes a major risk. Like this now becomes a security risk, but there are also other um, risks that you could um, easily run into or encounter or um, lose to if you don't have proper quality control checks. Um, improved product quality. Implementing the right quality management systems lead, lead to improved product quality. QA ensures continuous improvement of the product. YQC testing helps to uncover areas of refinement, ultimately leading to a higher quality product. So with your QA, what you're ensuring is continuous improvement through your product process. But um, with QC, um, you're ensuring the refinement or um, the need for refinement or um, um, fixing for your product before you launch. And this would um, basically, at the end of the day, provide um, a more efficient product for your user or your users. Um, the key differences be between QA and QC, the, the first one is the goal. Um, QA is proactive. Um, the goal for QA with, with QA is that um, it is to proactively address proactively address issues that could lead to potential quality errors throughout the product development process. Remember I said, um, with QA, you're continue, it's just what you continue to do throughout the process you're, for every um, um, implementation. Um, I think before integration, you are worried, like you are checking in, um, you're checking to see that um, what you're doing is working or what you intended to do is what you're actually working in line with. But um, with QC, it is reactive. It is um, because of the way it is done at the end, right? At the end of your pro entire um, process, development process, you, what you are now doing is responding to um, defects and bugs. So his goal is to identify existing bugs, right? The goal for QA is to ensure that these bugs do not even exist. So it is to ensure that as you're building, you're removing um, or you're tackling all possible areas um, that could present a problem. But with QC, you're, you're waiting like for the, for the end of your process to find bugs that have been accumulated or um, have been collated um, through your process. So, and this is like your final check before you put your product in the market. So it, it's um, reactive. You're responding to existing bugs. 
the timing qa happens throughout the product development process qc takes place after the product team has built the product and before the product is launched um pre-launch the nature of qa is qa is in QA involves incorporating quality management process into the process of software development, um, such as documentation of quality standards, audits, code review, personal training, and the rest. Whereas QC um, focuses on the product and ensuring the final product quality meets standards. So basically, with QA, QA is more in line with operational um, yeah, just operational activities, right? Where you're ensuring um, things like um, um, documentation and um, uh, like through audits and code reviews, right? This is more, um, this comes more from a, a space of operations, right? You're trying to ensure that the operations um, of the QA team and uh, the, 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 the QA engineers and um, just the, the um, entire engineering team, um, you're trying to ensure operationally that, you know, it, it comes from a place of trying to ensure that operationally they are looking out for your products, right? But um, with the QC, it focuses on a final product that you have at hand and ensuring that it meets standards. So like um, there is a slight difference in the way that, um, or in the nature of QA and QC. The role of a PM in quality management. While the product manager is kept abreast on the entire quality management process relating to the product, they typically either take a hands-on approach to quality control, which involves product testing, or they conduct the product testing themselves. As previously explained, Quality control involves testing the product against the standard product requirements, which are documented on the PRD. In doing so, however, the, P the PM has to also keep in mind four out of five aspects of quality management, the product performance, usability, reliability, and interoperativity, and interoperability against which the product's quality will be tested. So um, basically, product managers are either um, either being like just in a supervisory role when it comes to quality management, like you're just supervising what the um, what the QA team has going on, or um, the or the QC um, process. You're just supervising either that, or you're fully involved in the testing. I've had to test um, products myself using um, environments like a mobile device or um, mobile device or um, things like a laptop or a desktop or like just um, at whatever environment I like. I've had to test different products myself, but um, there are sometimes, most times, you don't have to do any testing yourself. Um, it, it really depends on how your firm works um for most fintechs you will find yourself having to test um or run some tests yourself um just to confirm um what has been the report that has been given to you or just to actively be like um i'll give an example if you work with a fintech most likely the first account that will be used to test your new implementations or new um features will be yours most likely before um like right after the QA testers are done and you've been notified that they are done and they're ready to give reports, you, for me, before the report is given to me, I ask that I do the test myself as well, um, because it's one thing to to test with, um, you, you know, there are test account numbers that, that exist for, for fintechs that are generated for fintechs, but during their testing phase, you generate, um, a test account number, a test profile, a test ID, all those things. So when they are done and they are ready to file their report, I use my actual account to test um, for everything, all the features that we have implemented in that particular phase or sprint. Um, because my goal is, yes, it works on your screen as a QA tester, as um, a backend. Yes, it works, but um, what 
something that is even most likely or uh, more relatable to what our users will be experiencing is an actual account number and that i can um that i have and that i can test with before i allow um, a final report submitted so most times you might not have to do all of that but there are certain situations especially um, when it's um, something as sensitive as a fintech space you would want to run your tests yourself not to discredit whomever has done their um professional testing but you're a product manager when something goes wrong it falls back to you so it's very important that you you cover yourself and you protect your interest in every phase of development <clears throat> it is also important to note that it is common practice for for the term QA and QC to be used interchangeably. If you notice, I've been doing that too. I'm so used to saying QA. Um, however, already knowing that PM's job is the QC aspect of quality management, of quality management helps you understand expectations. So if your manager or an interviewer uses QA to refer to testing, you should understand what they mean nonetheless. So, um, not to go to an interview and um, correct everybody, you know, in your panel, but um, it's just important to understand that people use QA and QC interchangeably. It's like what I was saying in the tech space. A lot of things are used interchangeably. Doesn't make you right. It's just um, that's the norm. But it's important that for you as um, a product manager internally, like for yourself, for your documentations, like for your official documentations, you understand the proper application or um, the proper usage and context. Yeah, context for which certain words or terms, even with all their similarity to each other, should be used. Building an efficient testing process. A well-defined testing process is the backbone of delivering high quality products. Essential elements involved in the QA process are requirements gathering. This is the foundation. Clearly, clearly defined product requirements on the PRD, including features, functionalities, and expected behaviors detailed requirements to facilitate the identification of deviations during testing. Now, remember that um, when it comes to QC, um, you, are the, you are measuring against a standard or um, yeah, against a standard, a predetermined standard, right? And this standard um, within your product requirements should be very clear and well communicated and um, it should cover things like the features, the functionalities, the expected responses and behaviors. Um, you want this to be clearly stated because once you get to testing phase um, of your process, it's important that you're measuring against set out standards and you're not um, testing blindly, right? And that's what makes QC, QC. Test planning, don't leave things to chance develop a comprehensive test plan that outlines what will be tested, the testing methodology, manual, automated, or a combination, and the criteria for success. Yeah, um, this is the acceptance criteria as well. So while you are planning for your testing, um, or while you are getting to your testing phase, you want to have a set out plan for your testing process. You, like nothing is by chance, you want to um, make a decision on are we doing an automated testing or are we doing a manual testing and something you also want to ensure is that for most products you don't want um you don't want um like you don't want a complete automation where right after testing and once the system says yes because a system is a system right like a system will just check off a system is like AI. It, it will say yes to, once it says yes to certain things, it checks off and it, if you allow a full-on automated process, once it checks it off as the machine that it is, it will go ahead and launch your product. And for me, I have never seen a product manager that has allowed a complete 
a completely automated testing process. So um, usually it's a combination of both manual and automated um, process measured against the um, different acceptance criteria for different features. Test case design. This is where your plan materializes. Craft test cases that cover a wide range of scenarios, including positive test flows, negative test flows, and edge cases. Consider typical user interactions, potential failure points, and diverse user contexts. This is where um, this is where things like your user persona comes in. Your um, and then your assumptions, right? Where you make assumptions about um, the possible outcomes of using your product. Now, be, beyond the user persona, or even from the user persona. So, if you say um, your your workout app, and you say a geriatric by a geriatric, I mean an older individual, retired, and all, uh, will be using your app. You want to also think of the possible things that a geriatric or an older person could experience in using your app. So you want to make room for that. And then you want to think about certain bugs that could come from them doing certain things with your app or making certain mistakes with your app. And um, you want to make room for that. And then you want to think about edge cases, like things that are very unlikely to happen but could happen nonetheless. So uh, that's your edge case. And um, just your test case design should be very expansive to a place where you're considering different scenarios with um, at different levels of usage or um, at different levels of the user journey for each user persona. That's basically what you're doing with your test, test um, case design. Um, test execution, um, time to put your test cases into action. Once the developers are done with writing code for product functionality and push it to testing environments, conduct thorough testing across different browsers. Now remember, um, when codes are completely um, integrated, you are you've pushed to a testing environment, you want to um, you don't want to sign off on on um, pushing to prod or pushing to production without being able to say that like everything, every standard that we've set for this has been met, right? Because remember, um, not every, like for every situation that comes up with um, product development or your development process, most people are not thinking of um, your, des your designers, your developers, everybody is going to turn towards the product manager, like what happened? right nobody is thinking about your like let's let's check in with the de development team and and mind you for most um tech firms people do not communicate with your developers without you present or without um meeting with you first because it's your job to protect the focus of your developers let me repeat it is your job as a product manager to protect the focus of your um, developers. So when, say, a ticket has come in about a bug or um, a constant issue being experienced with using your product, it might not be an actual bug, but it's just um, something that is not easy to, um, easy to figure out when trying to use your product. Nobody sends tickets directly to these um, developers nobody ever does that i haven't seen a firm that allows that every ticket concerning the product in itself or the features of a product goes straight to the product team it goes straight to if, if if say um you are the product manager for say the loan um for a banking app you and there is a constant report about filling out the forms to um to be a part of the people that will be using the loan or something to sign on for the loan. If there's a problem with that, nobody's going to um, assign that ticket to um, a developer. It's, it's it's not even done. Their names will not even be attached. Like 
they can't even be um, attached to a ticket like that. You share tickets to them. You create tickets for them from the information that you've gathered from um, the feedback loop that you have created with the customer experience team. But they don't ever have to worry about communication with outsiders ever. They don't have to worry about communication with other people without your consent, without your presence. And the reason is that it's very easy to distract um, developers. You want um, you want a situation where um, you have their full attention because, um, especially if you're in a phase where you're still developing things, you want their full attention where for every new um, for for how do I put this? Uh, for for every new decision you make, you want their focus on what you are working on. You don't need people or external forces outside of you and that team, that development team, distracting them. You need their focus on what they are doing, and it's very easy to distract um, developers. So it's your job to, you know, control the things that they consume per request or um, per request and complaints. It's your job to control that so that you can have their focus. And um, okay, so I'm um, sorry, I deviated a little bit. I just wanted to put, to um, touch on how um, how like how it works with your developers and you know this whole testing thing. Um, it says here, yeah, once the developers are done with writing code for product functionality and pushed it to testing environment, conduct thorough testing across different browsers, devices, and operating systems, like we talked about before, it's important that um, your, your product is very compatible with all kinds of operating systems, all kinds of tests, all kinds of environments, be it um, mobile devices, be it... Um, um, what you call them, whatever else is out there, but um, all kinds of devices, and um, you want um, all kinds of browsers and operating systems. So um, you want your product to be compatible with all of them because you don't want to limit yourself. And if you if there is a limit to that, then you are automatically reducing your market share, and that's not what you want. Um, Defect management, bugs are inevitable, like we've mentioned before. While the goal for each new product is to not encounter bugs at all, um, but bugs are inevitable nonetheless. You, 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 you have to have a mind um, or have a system for addressing bugs for your developers. Therefore, establish a system for logging, tracking, and prioritizing defects for timely resolution. Implement a clear communication strategy to ensure developers understand the impact of identified issues. Communication and reporting transparency is key. If a bug or an issue that could impact launch date has been identified during testing, it is important to inform all relevant stakeholders of this new development while working with the team to resolve issue to resolve the issue and set new launch dates so um it's it's not um a terribly i mean everybody's goal is to meet up with their deadlines or um with their promised launch date right but let's say something happens along the way i think what most people just expect from you is to provide them with information do not keep them in the dark um, especially stakeholders that are already involved in your process everybody needs to be as informed that you don't hoard information it doesn't help you um, in the long run it doesn't even help you in the short run you, you need to keep everybody um, informed so for most development teams there is a lot of transparency with work which is where during stand-up is like nobody, everybody knows what you're working on and where you are with what you're working on because it's very important that nothing is a surprise. If there are no surprises or if there is no hurting of information, then there are no surprises. And if there are no surprises, it's easy. It becomes easier to tackle um, issues as they come up. Some common QA tools um out there when it comes to product testing there are 
multiple tools for testing products, either in in a live product production environment or in test environment. Some of them include Browser Stack. It is a tool that enables QA testers test their products across multiple browsers or operating systems and devices. So Browser Stack um, major, majorly would assist you with um, adaptability or compatibility of your product with um, different browsers, operating systems, and devices. Um, Firebase is a set of services and application provided by Google for product development, testing, and um, analytics management. Postman, Postman is very popular, especially in the fintech space. Postman is a manual testing tool used for testing APIs. Remember, APIs act as a bridge that allows software systems communicate, communicate and interact smoothly with each other. Um, I think somewhere down in our material, we'll go into APIs and um, their integration process and their, the testing of APIs. Um, let, me not, <clears throat> let me not overwhelm you with that information, but um, Postman is a very popular um, testing tool, especially for API integrations. In conclusion, Quality management is a crucial and final step of the product development process and green lighting and green lighting a product for launch means that you are giving your word that the products will meet user requirements and will deliver promised value on the market. This responsibility puts a lot of pressure on the product manager. Just like I said, when things go wrong with your product management process, Nobody is looking at anyone else but um, the product team, the product manager, the product intern, the um, head of products, the um, product specialist, the product analyst. Nobody is looking at any, any developer or um, QA tester or whatever. Like everybody's focus will become, oh, product manager, what happened? So you need to remember that when you're signing off on um, when you're signing off on um, your your quality control report, for example, if you sign on if you sign off on a report, it means you're confirming that you are a witness to the fact that these tests have been done, and they passed every um, what you call it, they've passed every phase and they meet all um, requirements. Where was I? Um, this responsibility puts a lot of pressure on the product manager because if, if something fails, then you are accountable for it. Hence, it is important to conduct meticulous testing across your product. Test against the four aspects of quality management. Ensure that product, the product meets the requirements defined on the PRD and use the appropriate testing tools and procedures to ensure you are delivering, you are delivering a quality product to users. In um, in Recon, we talked about how cross functional how cross functional the role of product manager is and its intersection between business technology and user experience. Quality management falls under the technology aspect of the Venn diagram. I think everybody remembers the first thing we discussed in this um, cohort was um, the Venn diagram between business technology and user experience aspect of product management. Um, quality management is an aspect or a part of the technology aspect of product management. Um, considering how diverse a PM's role tends to be, it's easy to become overwhelmed by the amount of work and context switching required, required um, to function in this role. However, remember you have a team to rely on for support and most of your responsibilities outlined become second instinct the longer you perform. So this is basically to say, um, in the beginning of your career as a product manager, you will tend to struggle with, because there's a lot of context switching. Like you could be talking about the same thing. You could be talking about the same design, but when you discuss it with different um, cross-functional teams. For example, if you're talking about design, 
um, and I'm discussing design with the marketing team, what I'll be saying to the marketing team will be very different from what I'll be saying to the design team. It would also be very different from what I'll be saying to the developers. So um, this can get overwhelming, when, like when you're new to this. But with time, you start, you start to find the balance, um, how to balance out these conversations and how to tackle um, like that one topic in different contexts. It comes to you, like the more you do it, the, like the more it comes to you. Just ensure that you give room for people to assist you or people to, to use people's roles to achieve the things you need to achieve, right? Um, don't try to figure it all out by yourself. Like give yourself a chance to fail. Maybe not fail completely, but like give yourself a chance to learn from your mistakes. That helps too. And that is the end for this lesson. Um, I'm not sure whether to take questions right now or to start with the second lesson and we'll take all the questions after that. So for the second lesson, given the time, I'm going to try to do about half of the lesson and we'll finish it up next week before we get into the lesson for next week. Um, if anybody has a question, prepare your question for the end of the class. We can take a few questions after that. And um, I would ask for about three, min yeah, three minutes break. So that will be 6.23. Um, so everybody take a breather and take water and um, sip on your water and prepare for um, our next lesson. And I'll see you then.
Okay. Hi, everybody. We are back. Um, I hope everyone is back to their devices. And um, let's start with the lesson for today. The actual lesson for today. Okay. So, um, product testing methodologies. Um, we have been discussing the concept of quality management and hence quality assurance and then quality control. Um, it's only right that we talk, we talk about um, the product testing methodologies and just the whole concept. Um, we'll be discussing, um, we'll be introducing you to product testing and then the methods for product testing and a conclusion to that. The aim of it of testing a product is to ensure that it meets requirements, user needs, and deliver on business goals. It involves evaluating a product to ensure that it meets these requirements before it is re released to the market. There are several testing methods in existence, and your selection will be dependent on the type of product and the product development approach which the organization runs. There are two major product testing approaches which software development organizations run. They are product testing by product development approach and product testing by environment. For the context of this course, we will only address product testing by product um, development approach. Um, I think somewhere further down, I will, I will be taking on um, um, product testing by um, environment. I think it's very important to me that you um, have some understanding of um, the different environments when it comes to product development. Um, I may not be able to deliver it in full, you know, like the full context, but just enough for you to understand um, what people mean when they talk about product like product environment and um, talk about the testing environment and the production environment and how we get there. And um, but for now, we had, we'll just be discussing um, product testing by product development approach. Product testing based on product development approach. Generally, software development teams run product development based on two common um, methodologies or frameworks. Is it that it's waterfall methodology or is um, agile methodology? Waterfall methodology. Product teams that use the waterfall methodology perform perform product activities in a chronological order or in a staircase order. And usually work does not commence on the next project unless the previous step has been completed. The order of work in um, waterfall approach includes requirements gathering, design, implementation, that's coding, product testing, launch slash feedback gathering, right? The course for um, the course for this program has been teaching um, product development from this waterfall standpoint. Um, I think it's important for me to mention something. There isn't anywhere it is stipulated that you must um, follow just one type of um, or one approach to product development, right? Um, if you stay in the industry long enough, you'll find out that people follow um, more than one approach to product development. And that is because product development in itself is very tasking. You most times find that you cannot depend on just one approach to get things done. You most likely, yes, you would say that in your approach, in the totality of your approach, you lean towards like you lean more towards one approach. Yes, you could say that, but you would most likely be uh, picking up things from different approaches um, to create your own system. I think the systems for tech firms are usually very personalized. 
um, you could have similarities, especially if, if say, something like if CUDA and uh, money points are both um, leaning more towards ag uh, um, the agile methodology, then um, they'll have a lot of similarities. But in reality, um, it's a very personalized decision for, especially for like the head of product or for the product manager in particular, for like a particular product manager. And um, product managers are allowed a lot of autonomy in that sense because it's important that it is like their process is personalized to them so it allows them work the best way that they can be efficient to you and the delivery of your product that they are managing so i like it's just important that i mention that but for the purpose of learning and um, we're of course differentiating between the two and trying to understand them as um, stand alone approaches in terms of quality management, conducting accurate testing at organizations using waterfall approach to develop products is dependent on accurate and clear documentation of expectations and requirements. So given that given that waterfall is such a step-by-step -step approach, right? Like it has such um, a defined um levels approach like you do this first and then you do this and then you do this it's like communication and um um what do you call it communicating and um just documentations and all those things um it's it's a very important aspect of like the waterfall approach because if 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 you're able to communicate that one level is done or if your documentation communicates that one level is done like completely done with and that means we can move on to the next level that's like it it, it gives room for um or it requires a clear communication and then it also gives room for um you know being able to finish one thing before you move on to the other thing. So there is a clear cut between um, processes or phases in your in your, in your development process. So for each phase, there is always a clear cut, like we are done with this, we've completed this, and it meets um, the acceptance criteria. Now we can move on to the next thing. So that's like, I think in a sense, that's an advantage to it. Now about Agile methodology, using Agile methodology, product teams break down projects into short developmental cycles. Um, by the way, the Agile methodology is very popular within the FinTech space called Sprint. And after every Sprint, the goal is to release a working product into the hands of users. This methodology involves continuous testing of products based on of the product based on users' feedback from the previous um, release at every stage of the product development process. So um, this is iteration um, from user feedback loop, basically is what we are talking about here. So um, with Agile methodology, we have sprints, right? And um, within each sprint, you are working, like you have a stipulated plan of what you are working on or what would be worked on. Agile product testing is great for product teams and organizations that require flexible planning and a continuous um, consumer loop. Like I said, um, the whole concept of Agile methodology um, wraps itself around iteration. It's important that a feedback loop is created and that um, developments are made from um, information gathered from um, users or consumers and um, and it, it gives room for flexibility right um, the whole thing with agile methodology is that it allows um, like it allows um, improvement without assuming um, certainty like if you don't assume certainty it means there is room for improve there's always room for improvement and i personally i feel like it um it gives more room for a better uh user-friendly product because the the um there's a lot of room for user empathy with agile methodology 
um, I, I feel like that's his biggest advantage. There's a lot of room for consideration um, or considering um, feedback from users, which then makes your uh, product user focused. Having determined, having determined which approach of product development your organization runs, it will be easier to identify which testing method will be ideal for your product. One concept testing. Concept testing involves um, inv involves involving users early, early on in the product development process, so as to ensure the team is working on projects that align with that align with users' needs. This is achieved using an online survey, and the survey is designed to determine users' perceptions about your concepts or ideas. The feedback collected from the survey is then used to determine what customers prefer. This is similar to quantitative user research, but the difference here is that there is a specific concept that the product team is testing, right? Um, so I feel like this doesn't really need explanation, but let me give the example here. For example, a product team looking to test a new logo or an onboarding page can use can use concept testing or with a combination of A-B testing to gauge users like, remember A-B testing is comparing, like in A-B testing, you're comparing two things, two existing items, and you're trying to decide which one um, works more for you or which one meets your standard more. That's what A-B testing is, a comparison between two items. It might not be a product, just generally, A-B testing is comparing two things, A and B. And um, the whole concept testing like allows for you to gain the opinion, opinion, yeah, the preference, um, or to gain insight into the preference of your target audience um, with what you intend, to, like you already have a concept that you're working on or that you're trying to work on. So you're presenting them with the idea of that concept and you want to find out what their preference will be or how they would like you to deliver that to them. So the focus is um, on user need and user preference. A-B testing. A-B testing, also known as split testing or bucket testing is a testing approach that involves dividing users into two separate groups and showing a varying version of the product to users in each group and using a b testing it is not that an entirely different screen is displayed by to users but just one or two elements will vary for each version here the product team is attempting to test for a particular element and gather feedback based on user behavior to inform decision making during the development process. Um, for example, a product team might be working on improving onboarding process in the process and in the process determines that they would a product team might be working on improving onboarding process and with the process determine what they would like to test or determine, determine that they would like to test several payment options to see which route to optimize for. The options could include pay with transfers um, or save card details on the product. Okay, so basically um, what we're saying here is that, say for example, we have a product team and we are trying to figure out um, which of the payment, like for our product, which of the payment options um, will be preferred by, like we are trying to choose one. We are not trying to give um, um, like several options, but we want them to decide by themselves. Like we want to gain, to gain insight into what it is that our users will prefer or our target audience. It might not be your actual users, they could just be your target audience, but you um, you created a survey to find out which um, which of the processes or sorry which of the payment options um, is more popular for them. Now it's not a hidden thing that um, pay, payments with card is not something that Nigerians embrace so much. 
but it's not completely turned away from it. It makes payments easy for users. So some users, you really do buy the idea of um, card payment. So you want to um, gather information about um, the most popular for your um the most popular option for your target audience what do they prefer the most so um if every or almost everyone within that survey group is choosing um pay with transfer and you're trying the option like within your team internally you already know that you can only afford to provide them with one payment like one payment service or payment gateway then um you know if everyone is picking pay with transfer, you already know that pay with transfer is what you're working with. But the way it's presented to them is in such a way that you um you know do, you might not do this or this. You just do the survey in such a way that um you gather how they feel about pay with transfer, and then you gather how they feel about pay with card. It might not be like it's not necessarily that you would do um between pay pay with transfer and pay with card. Which do you prefer? No. Sometimes it's trying to understand their behavior towards the two options that will allow you or give you the room to um make a decision on which one to go with. It's just about their response or their behavior to it. Know that it is possible. Know that it is possible for both options to exist on the product. However, presently, the team lacks the resources or time to implement both, hence the need to neglect and optimize for the best option. By showing these two different payment options to two groups of their, of their users, they will observe user behavior to see which version has the best user engagement and they will opt and they will opt for that option. Okay, so something you can also do with A-B testing is having two user groups and um, two options. So you're presenting two of these user groups with um, two, the two different options and you're observing their responses to both of them. And the thing is that if for each user group, you have an understanding that most of your users fall into like one of the user groups, right? That means this user group is more popular and your target audience, most of them fall into this user group. And that same user group is choosing one particular um, one particular payment option. Then you already know that this is the payment option you're going for. The goal is to test a single variable between the two versions to see which version converts better. <clears throat> QA testing. This is the traditional product testing method involved in the product development process at, soft, at software development companies. This involves testing a product before launch to highlight and resolve bugs or errors. Once issues have been resolved by the development team, the product is ready to launch, like we discussed earlier. <clears throat> know that regardless of whether the other testing methods are adopted, traditional QA testing is still essential. Yes. Um, usability testing, as the name implies, usability testing involves testing how users are able to use your products by asking them to complete specific tasks and watching them do it. It involves gathering feedback um, based on your observation of how real users of your product interact with it. Um, remember how I always talked about control life where you um, have a select group of people and um, you, you make your, um, your testing environment available to them and you observe how they interact with your product to figure out the usability um, of your product. Sometimes this can just happen within, I'll give an example. When I work with fintechs, what I do is that my colleagues become my um, control life audience um, because they already have, first of all, they already have the accounts that we need for the testing. And it's easy for us to manipulate things back end for the testing or within the test environment, and they know why we are doing that. Um, but we also don't approach it like they are our colleagues. We approach it like they are actual users that would be um, using our product when it's within the market. So um, the whole point is to observe their interaction with your product and how useful your product is for them or to them. 
User test, usability testing can be done at any point of product development process and it's done between a tester and a real life user. The tester gives the user specific tasks to complete and observes the user's behavior on the products while also listening to feedback. First click testing. With first click testing, product teams are testing to see which part of the user interface users click when they are trying to complete tasks. This testing method is great for any product with a user interface such as websites, apps, or mobile web pages, and is used to test whether the product flow or page navigation is effective in helping users complete their intended tasks. This type of testing helps the team identify areas to place CTA buttons or important information relevant to the user's interaction. So basically what you're trying to observe with first click and testing is how uh, your idea of what your, the, your interface, how your users interact with your interface versus um, the actual interaction. What that helps you do is it helps you eliminate certain buttons. It helps you eliminate certain um, features and helps you edit and improve certain features to fit um, to to fit user needs, like based on the point of view of the users. Because for every product you're creating or you're developing, a lot of the things that you would do is from your point of view as a as um, a product manager or as a developer or as a designer, right? Um, with assumptions, first click testing then allows you room to do, um, to have, to finally have a real, a realistic view of um, your user's point of view when it comes to, when it comes to user interface and their interaction with your interface, right, or your designs. Um, then we have regression testing. Okay. I think since we have just two pages left, we can continue this. Um, we can continue this and finish this today. And um, I am not sure about the questions. It might, this might make our question session very short and brief. That's if anybody has questions. So let's just, it's just two pages left. Let's conclude with those. Regression testing is done to test a product's existing features as more updates are added to the product. The chances of bugs cropping up and resulting in breakdown of the product as more features are added to the product is likely. So um, your, regression your regression testing allows you basically understand the interaction between existing features or existing functionalities and the ones that you are trying to introduce. So what it does for you is to make sure that um, all of the features are compatible with each other and that the interaction between features are smooth. You don't want a situation where um, you introduce a new functionality and it's clashing with the existing one um, or with the existing functionality. You want them to run with each side by side each other and um, to create a functional product. That's your goal. So in a situation where you, you're doing a regression testing and you realize that these two, um, these two features are not interacting properly or they keep um, crashing the app, which is something that does happen sometimes, um, then you know there is a problem and then you try to fix the interaction between two features or two functionalities. So basically what regression testing does for you is that it, um, it helps you manage interaction between two features or two functionalities within a product. Then in conclusion, product testing is critical to the success of a product. And while it can be, it can be a responsibility designated to a QA tester. Oftentimes, a product manager can find themselves perf themselves performing this task. It's worth it to also note that QA testing can be complicated depending on the nature of the product. Hence, there is an extent to which a product manager can function as a product tester beyond which a professional QA tester might be required on the project. So, um, what this conclusion is saying is that while um, while your major role is a product manager, you you would find yourself very often having to test products 
to be able to testify yourself that um, you've completed every every phase of your product development process. And um, for every fault or any possible fault that could be found in your process or during your launch, it won't result from negligence because if like there are things that if you don't do as a product manager, it is accounted for as ne negligence. But um, it's also important to remember that um, there is only so much a product manager can do when it comes to testing, right? Um, you're not, you're most likely not going to be a certified QA tester or QA engineer. So um, definitely you are not expected to be perfect at this, but you're expected to have a knowledge of functioning knowledge, of, not just knowledge, a functioning knowledge of it, such that you can do primary testing, you can do um, basic testings, right? Until where you can no longer function or where more expertise is now needed and the services of a QA tester is then required. Remember that the choice of which testing method is dependent on the product development approach undertaken by the organization. And it is also common practice to combine multiple testing methods in one product development phase. Like I mentioned, some people, you will always find that um, teams would combine more than one testing method. Um, it's not just something that like you pick one, but you could say that they lean more towards a particular testing method, but um, it doesn't mean they are, they are most likely not going to be using just, you know, the principles of one method or the, um, the process of one, the processes involved in just one method of testing. And that brings us to the conclusion of, um, our second topic. So, um, that's a huge win for us next week. You can just focus on next week's lesson. And, um, I do hope the break we took on Saturday helped us. And um, let's see if we have any questions, um, do raise your hands up and do raise your hands up and we can call you for your questions. I think I got disconnected and that means um, I'm no longer sharing my screen, but we are still recording. Hold on, please. Okay, we are still recording. So um, it's okay that I have stopped sharing my screen. Um, I can't Tunde, I can't Sonia. I hope I am pronouncing your name right. Please go ahead and ask a question. Um, your hands, you've raised your hand to ask a question. Okay. Hi. Hi, Sandra. Thank you for the class. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. So, um, I wanted to ask, um, so, um, based on, I just wanted to get, um, clarity based on your experience as a PM, is, are there any point, um, uh, point of view where, um, uh, when you are employed as a PM on it to come and oversee a product and everything do they also expect you to be like a full like probably the development does not does not consist of a QA tester do they expect you to be a QA tester and this is not just the quality control part that is it covers the whole aspect of it oh i have never seen that Okay. Okay. So this is what I will say. I've only had one experience working with a brand new startup, but I think that I'm missing, like having some roles that are not filled is such a startup thing. If you're working with an already established firm, um, they might not be so big or so fully established, but they are quite established. You would never, that is not something you would ever experience, but with startups, most times they don't have enough funding to hire, you know, the tiny little um, roles or those roles that you feel like are not so out there. But um, that's something that you can experience with working with startups because most times they struggle with, you know, funding or um, structure and all that. So um, QA testing, 
brand new products, the, the level of QA testing they need is not so deep. Um, just to say in the most simple terms, it's not usually so deep, right? Like this is a brand new product. This is, um, I don't know how to explain it. They, given the resources that they have available, they have, they also have lower expectations, right? For example, Money Point is not going to hire a product manager and expect them to um, be their QA tester in any capacity. Now, if you as a product manager, as part of your like your personal decision to always be hands-on with testing, that is up to you. But they have their QA testers that could just give you a report and you will go ahead and launch your product after the entire um, phase, right? But um, when if you're talking about a brand new startup, they most likely would not have a QA tester yet, at least for the first launching, for the first go-to-market um, process. They would have the most likely thing is that they won't have um, a QA test and you would have to do the testing with the development team. So if there, if there are no QA testers, you are not expected to be the QA tester, you, but you are expected to be hands-on with the development team. So the development team, um, you will figure out what to do and how to go about it with them. So they understand engineering more than you, of course. You're just there to oversee and supervise what is being done and ensure that the requirements that you've created and acceptance criteria that you've created by yourself is being met by the product. You're not necessarily there to be, to suddenly become an engineer that you are not, right? That's just how it works. So it's about how um, established the firm you're working with is. Okay. Um, Okay, go on. Yeah, so um, in the event of um, creating um, tickets like on GitHub or Linear or other, um, mm -hmm. other tools out there like Jira, uh, I believe this is the quality control aspect you were talking about, you explained to us in the class. So uh, mm -hmm. are you creating this um, for the, um, what's the word now? Are you creating it for the QA? testers to um to make assurance or what's the i don't know how to put it right are we creating okay. the tickets for uh, the QA testers? Oh, after the like you created the tickets for the developers quite all right but uh, after, yeah. after the developers have executed on their own parts are the QA testers coming mm -hmm. to make um, quality assurance on those um tickets being fixed and developed the bugs okay so yeah. So usually for me, um, there's a different ticket for QA testers. And it's just usually for, for me, it's one ticket. Like if we have a new feature we are trying to launch um, and we are almost done, then I create a ticket. The ticket would involve my, or would include my acceptance criteria and uh, my requirements. This requirement is usually also the same thing that appears on my PRD right? Um, if there are updates, it should also be seen, but like usually um, it's the exact same thing for my PRD. Um, um, the reason I have it separate is that there, there are no confusions about communication. This is what I want from the QA team. And before I complete that ticket and I set it out, there, there would have been communication with the head of QA or um, whomever the QA engineer is that I'll be working with on that project. The, the reason for that is that you, you don't want to create a ticket that feels unrelatable, right? They need to be able to have had this conversation about this with you and so that you people are on the same page as well. So in that situation, if you've had a conversation and then you're creating a ticket, you're creating a ticket based on the CTA, like the call to action from all the conversations you've had with them. And um, the conversation basically is just for them to understand what it is that you want from them. And um, after the verbal confirmation within the meeting, then you're creating the ticket to um, align with who is doing the testing for you or which of the engineers you'll be working with and what exactly they are testing for. And um, then you will create, they can create a report, um, a report plan. And also they can add it to the ticket. 
So that plan, based on the conversation you've had with them, you would approve of that plan. And then as they work and they give you feedback, you're checking on everything they've worked on. And then the final reports will be submitted to you, can be also be attached to the ticket as well, just for documentation. So um, for me, I've always created a different ticket for the QA team. I don't, I don't really tamper with like the engineering aspect of product management is very sensitive. Um, once I don't like tampering with my documentation for them because I also allow the head of engineering take a look and do updates and edits um, when he ha like, of course, we have conversations about it before he's able to do that. But of course, um, I want him to be able to feel some level of autonomy with um, the way I work with his team. Um, but I don't like I don't like clashing, like creating a situation where there could be clashes between two teams and that could happen if you don't handle the ticketing and all that properly. So I create a different ticket for my QA testers all the time. I hope that's what you were asking. Yes, yeah, that's correct. Okay. Um, someone else had his hands up. Ibrahim Adeleji, do you want to go ahead and ask? Ibrahim, are you there? Okay, um, I don't think Ibrahim is still here with us. Um, does anyone else have questions, comments? Okay, and um, I believe this brings us to the end of this session. Thank you everybody for participating today and um, uh, your assignment would be available to you by the close of business on Monday and um, the deadline for your assignment from last week will be updated to um, 11.59 p.m. Um, on Monday as well. So you will be able to submit after that time um, as well. So thank you for your time today and for showing up for yourself. Uh, do have a lovely end of your weekend and good luck on Monday.